The Irish Farmers Journal Weekly Podcast, brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy. Hello, I'm Thomas Hubert, digital editor with the Farmers Journal, and I'm here with our Western-based uh, livestock specialist, Nathan Duffy. Um, Nathan, you're publishing a March price review of the first half of the year. Um, can you give us a, a few insights on how you got the figures to start with? Thanks, Thomas. Yeah, I suppose just in, in the background of it, the Martwatch system, I suppose, is what we use every week on a, week, on a weekly basis through the back of the journal to report the, the live cattle trade and the price differentials from one week to another. The prices are supplied to us by the uh, by the livestock marts from right across the country, um, and they're fed into that system. We have a database at this stage going back since since 2006, so we have a huge data set at this stage of, of figures. Um, in terms of the Mart price review that that we're talking about today um what we're doing now at the moment is we're looking at the trade over the first six months of this year so from january until the end of june and we've compared that going back maybe you know five years um we have figures going back f- further than that but we're just comparing it in the last five years i suppose if you want to talk about the, the keynotes that are the key issues first, first yeah let's look at the the year on year change how does this year look compared to 2014 okay so i suppose um, in terms of 2014, um, we, 2014 was a slightly weaker year than 2013. Previously, we had seen prices uh, peak in 2012. But in terms of the difference between last year and this year, I suppose the one thing that's that's quite clear is the prices have kind of skyrocketed this year compared to last year. Um, that, I suppose, has been driven by slightly increased farmer confidence. For the first six months of the year, prices, beef price was strengthening. Um, cattle supplies of kind of store cattle and that were quite tight by time. So, you know, there was increased demand there. Um, we saw lower levels of live exports because of prices increase. Um, in some cases, we saw we saw prices jump by, you know, on average 135 euros a head. Um, for in the case of a 550 kilo steer on last year. So like that's just one example of how prices have, have increased. But I suppose if we look at average quality cattle uh, and we take it across all the all the different ranges and weights, they're they're up by somewhere between twenty to thirty five cent per kilo. Um, that's just compared to last year now, uh, which, as you said, was pretty low. Um, what about a, a longer term trend? If you look at the years before that, well, I suppose the one year that that you know sticks out in mind, Thomas, is. 2012. 2012, we saw peak prices, probably the, the highest ever live live uh, cattle prices were, were, were uh, existed in 2012, should we say. Um, but if we look at the first half of 2012 versus the first half of 2015, in most cases, we've actually surpassed the figures that, that were there in 2012. Um, so, you know, that's that's been driven nearly completely by farmer demand. Um, in, in most cases in the first half of the year, exporters were nearly priced out of the market for some cattle types. Um, so it's it's all domestic demand that's driving it. Um, as I said earlier on, I suppose driven primarily by uh, increasing beef prices um, up to the first half of the year. Um, we'll talk about you know what what's happened in the last couple of weeks now in a few minutes. But yeah, that's that's been the main driver force. So it has been uh, a record. We've seen record prices this year. And as you say, a uh, different type of buyer, uh, maybe more, more finishers active here. Uh, does that affect the type of cattle that are doing well this year? Yeah, um, yeah. I suppose one thing to note, in the last couple of years, we've been watching the differential between you know, the, top 30, the top third of cattle and the bottom third of cattle. And since the introduction of the quality payment scheme, or the, the QPS grid, as it's more commonly referred to, since the introduction of that, we saw that uh, the, the variation or the difference between the top and the bottom types of cattle increase year on year almost steadily over the last five or six years. I suppose the one thing to note in you know this year compared to last year is that the figures show that, that that has actually started to narrow in slightly in some cases. And I suppose one of the main drivers behind that is price. Um, you know, farmers are out there, cattle were a lot more expensive. Um, uh, and and they had I could suppose a finite amount of money to spend. So the the issue of quality wasn't as big this year as it was in previous years. So they were willing to pay that little bit more for the lesser quality of animal just to secure numbers. Um, but it has only been marginal, and it's probably something that will revert back again because the QPS grid it, it does have a significant effect on live cattle prices. So slightly different buying there in terms of quality. Is that also the case in terms of um, the the gender or the age of animals that do well or not? 
Um, I suppose if you look at we'll look we'll look at gender first. Um, the one thing that stands out this year is the, the trade for heifers and and weaning heifers and and uh, and and store heifers in particular. Um, last year we saw a particularly difficult beef trade right through the year. Um, there was a lot of difficulties uh, for for farmers with finished cattle that were slightly out of spec. So I suppose the one thing that we that you know since since the last since the second half of last year especially we saw farmers focus more in on that good type of animal um, that that is going to to meet this the required specification. Um, and and we've seen an increase in the, in the demand for heifers especially, and and that's reflected in the prices this year as well. Whereas you know. The uh, forward store uh, bullocks bullock prices may not have fully increased above the 2012 levels this year. Heifers went completely above it, so it it just shows that, that there is increased demand out there for heifers um, over over steers in the past 12 months. Now that's where we're at now. Um, how can you see the, the market evolving after this uh, this point in time that you've studied uh, in the- this issue? Difficult question, Thomas. I suppose nobody is a crystal ball, so we, we can't tell exactly what's going to happen. Um, I suppose we've seen fluctuations in the last couple of weeks. Um, I'll, I'll just, you know, the, there has been a few issues that have come up over the last couple of couple of weeks or a couple of months in the mart trade. Numbers of cattle coming uh, passing through marts over the summer period have been well up this year compared to other years. Normally, you'd see a big fall off or a big lull during the midsummer period when you know farmers have buy their stock in the in the springtime and generally finish or sell again in the autumn, um, based on housing and things like that. But this year, we saw a more continuous flow of cattle through the marts. Um, that possibly may have been driven by the high prices. People were trying to capitalise in in case there was a fall off later on in the year. Um, in terms of wh- where it's going or where it has been c- gone in the last couple of weeks, I suppose poor weather has has had a big effect in some areas, but probably about two weeks ago, um, it did have an effect on the average prices that you might have seen in the Martwatch uh, section of the journal. But that was primarily driven by an increase in lesser quality cattle coming onto the market in that week or two weeks or whatever. Um, in the past week, we've seen prices stabilise again. Um, farmers continue to be quite active. Um, especially for store cattle. I suppose one thing to note is at the moment wean- the wheeling trades are the autumn wheeling sales are just starting to kick off. Um and where the sales have occurred prices are probably firm or where you know they're they're about where they left where they were leaving off in the spring. So early indications are good. Um in terms of what's going to happen in the back end it's difficult to know like in, in the last couple of weeks the beef trade has become a little more difficult for farmers finishing cattle. Um, that always will have an impact on the live trade. Um, we don't know. Um, we don't know what kind of pressure is going to come on uh, in the next couple of months. It purely depends on the flow of cattle. Um, early indications would suggest that that finished cattle are going to be tight right up to the end of the year. So, all in all, it should be reasonably positive for the back end. Nathan, thank you very much. All the detailed tables from the Smart Price Review for the first half of the year are in this week's Irish Farmers Journal and at farmersjournal.ie. Thanks, Thomas. We hope that you're enjoying this Irish Farmers Journal podcast brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy. Find out more at farmersjournal.ie. Hello, Patrick Dunno here, news editor with the Irish Farmers Journal. And I'm joined by our dairy specialist, Aidan Brennan, to talk about the difficult weather conditions we've seen over the past few days. Aidan, you're welcome. Thanks, Patrick. Aidan, up to 50 millimetres of rain or, or two inches in, in old money uh, fell over the weekend. What are you seeing on the ground out there at the minute? Yeah, sure. It's very mixed depending on, 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 I suppose, the big thing really is, is your soil type. So those on heavy soils are struggling because not only are they getting the high quantities of rain, they're also on, on, on heavier soils that's retaining the, that moisture. So that's, they're the ones that are really struggling and particularly up north and, and along the, the western seaboard. Um, so I was talking to a man in Tyrone today and he's, he's autumn calving. The only cows he's out are his milkers. He's only 25 uh, cows that are, are still in milk and, and they're all outside. But everything else is inside. Dry cows are in uh, and, and uh, most of his young stock are in it's just just too wet but i mean generally that's you know that's the worst case scenario not everyone is in that is in that predicament um we're, we're, we, we tend to see there's a lot more uh, management involved in, in getting you know, a lot more work involved so and, and what do they actually do when you know in a, in a very real terms how are farmers managing the difficulty yeah sure it's all strip wires um block grazing a good bit of on-off grazing going on, where they're you know they're grazing for uh, two or three hours at a time, bringing the cows back into the shed and then letting them out again after evening milking for another couple of hours. Is you there know, much rehousing going on? There's a, there's a nice bit. I I, I suppose. Uh, 
more up up north as well. I'd say there's a, and along the west there's there's a bit more uh, stock being housed. Um, yeah, there 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 is. Yeah, and uh, I was just talking to another man today who's after going away now and, and buying silage because he's uh, he, he feels he's going to be short. If you know if the weather doesn't change and the indications are that it's not going to you know it's still going to be mixed enough for the next couple of weeks. These are these these are the things that people are doing. Buying silage, I suppose, and rehousing. It's 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 not everywhere as you say yourself. And we've seen this suppose this this summer lot a kind of a, an east west split on it in, in terms of rainfall is that really what it is is it north south or is it yeah like I, I, what i'm speaking here there's probably worst case scenarios like i mean the majority of the country is still they're still out grazing and, and there's no issue there but yeah, particularly yeah there is a there's a big east west divide um maybe more north south really than than east and west um talking to a couple of guys around tipperary today and you know like f- and, and tipperary and Leash, the last couple of weeks they've been looking for rain um but now you know there's a down down south further south in Cork they've had a very wet uh, June and July but they're they've had a dry couple of weeks um, the last while. But How, yeah, it's, how's it's, grass growing in general? Pretty good. Our grass plus um, for this week is going to show up an uh, average average growth rate around sixty kilos a day, which is is there thereabouts what you'd want. Um, some guys are growing eighty or ninety. But uh, then uh, those in heavier soils, they're growing twenties and thirties. It's just waterlogged fields. Um, it's uh, you know uh, everything has gone yellow. Uh, grass is just holding its own. Like there's to be a good bit of meal supplementation there in that, is there? Uh, there would be, yeah, yeah, uh, meal and silage. Like so, there's a double a double whammy. You're not growing the grass, you're and you're feeding the silage. That's why those people are having to buy having to buy silage. And how are how are cows milking out generally across the country? What are is there much differentiation again between north and south? Um, I, I don't know the the differentiation between north and south, but. General terms, they're milking good. Um, what's coming into the crops is up a lot, is 16% um, in some of the southern processors. And uh, I think the average for a whole country is around 14% up in, on this time last year. Now, that's a combination of, of more cows in the ground. Um, again, it's weather dependent as to how cows are milking. Like, But um, fat and proteins are actually quite good. Protein seems to be up a lot more this year than it was last year. Um, talking to the guy today, he was at 4% protein. So... And generally, the sentiment, I know we're going through a pretty difficult time on, on the dairy side of things for, uh, with prices and whatnot. General sentiment out there? It's just mixed enough, Patrick. There's, uh, those that are heavily borrowed, are, uh, they're feeling a bit of a pinch at the moment. Probably more concerned about what's coming down the line as, as opposed to what's uh, actually happening now. Milk, milk price is 26, 27 cents a litre. So it's, you know, they're, they're coping now, I suppose. But if prices drop further, it's going to be a different scenario. So I mean, I'm encouraging people to do their uh, to, to find out their cost of production, do a budget, you know, at a number of different milk prices, and um, I suppose talk to people, talk to your advisor, talk to us in the journal, um, and, and and you know find out the steps that you could take to reduce your costs or to increase your output, whether that's selling stock or or, or whatever else. I mean, there's uh, there's options, there's always options available. Before you know, you don't have to take a hit in your own income. Of course, the um, the, the cold cow value is, is still. Is still pretty strong yeah 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 there's uh cold cows there's you know surplus heifers that could be sold or um but i suppose really like what we see on, on the average farm costs are still too high and there's plenty of scope there to reduce costs further and you know like you know traditionally when you get into high input regions like when you're talking about your north and south yeah. split uh are you seeing those too high costs right across the country I, there's very diff- in the okay I, in general terms as you go further north the costs tend to get higher but within that then there are individual operators who are really low cost and are you know are, are, are going to do pretty okay this year. So um, there's there's a uh, regional differences, but even within the regions, then there are big differences as well. And that's down to technical ability uh, and and just understanding your own cost of production and, and and your own business really like. And how does a farmer go about doing you know starting from scratch? What 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 do they need to take into account when doing a cost of production? Sure, probably some of the most effective ones I've seen are those that are written in the back of an envelope. To be honest, you don't need you don't need fancy computers or, or big programs to do it. Like just you know uh, money in, money out, and uh, and uh, if you, if you understand, if you look at that, you'll see what the big items are. In general terms, it's the simple ones: it's the feed bill, it's the fertilizer bill, contractors, um, and like there's lots of scope in, in in especially with the feed one. I mean, we're, we have an article um, coming into this week's journal now. On on, uh, on supplementation this autumn and you know when grass is plentiful there's absolutely no economic benefit to be feeding meal there's plenty of scope there to reduce costs Aidan thanks very much and we can read more about uh, the weather conditions and also uh, cost productions in this week's Irish Farmers Journal You're listening to the Irish Farmers Journal podcast brought to you by Ornua the home of Irish dairy Hello Patrick Dunno here news editor with the Irish Farmers Journal and I'm joined by our market specialist Philip O'Neill to discuss the exportation of Irish beef to the US market Philip you're welcome Thank you very much. 
This week, Irish Agriculture Minister Simon Coveney said that the access of Irish beef to the US market is within touching distance. How close are we? That's true. Uh, Ireland has been exporting beef to the United States uh, since February of this year, and uh, at that point in time, the only approval that we had was for whole cuts of beef, for beef muscle, if you like. And the primary objective at that stage was to get high value steak mark. High value, the primary objective at that stage was to get high value steak meat into the top end American market. However, the real opportunity in the United States is for manufacturing, high quality manufacturing beef for the burger market. And uh, that's where the attractive market opportunity is for Ireland. But unfortunately, we haven't had a certificate agreed with the American authorities that would allow Irish uh, companies to export to the United States. That's what the minister referred to recently when he said that he feels that we're within a couple of months of getting that approval. So is there anything else stopping the Irish beef being, being sent over to the US? No. Uh, from what we understand there's a very real market opportunity there Australia will fin fill its quota to the United States sometime in either September or October of this year uh, there will be an opportunity there's an opportunity at the moment uh, because uh, manufacturing high quality manufacturing burger meat is worth up to a euro a kilo more there than it is in the European market uh, so the opportunity is there the difficulty is agreeing the certification with the American import authorities the American health authorities there are slightly different processes systems in the United States and Europe and the reality is both parties have to be content with what the other does to achieve the same objective in the American market for manufacturing beef. And what would this mean that to finally get uh, real access to the US market because we, some state cuts have gone over, you've wrote before about some volumes uh, going from Ireland to the US but in terms of getting manufacturing trade the, what would that do? Yeah, the, the real benefit uh, I suppose in terms of valuing of meat cuts, the uh, United States is a big exporter of hang quarter meat uh, we'd love to be exporting to Europe but the reality is it would send most of its supplies to Asia, particularly Japan so it's a big exporter of steak meat and it's a big exporter of round cuts they have a huge demand for manufacturing beef that has been increased in recent times because with drought in the United States their herds at its lowest point since 1950 so they are huge importers of manufacturing beef with Australia currently the top supplier. Uh, Australia puts in uh, 418,000 tonnes uh, of manufacturing, primarily manufacturing beef uh, per annum at the moment. And uh, that, if, to put that in some sort of context, that's 80% of the total Irish beef production. So if we could get a slice of that market, and there are plenty of other difficulties after we do get approval for it, we have a very tight quota, for example, of 64,000 tonnes to be shared out amongst a number of countries, including Brazil, who have recently been approved. So there is very, very limited opportunity there. Not all of that quota was used last year, but if there was some of that available in the latter months or weeks of this year, then I sense that there would be a real opportunity indeed to exploit. So I think what the minister said exactly was that it could be within a couple of months. Uh, we've heard now it was February and March, uh, and you, in fact, you were there uh, on the streets of New York when, when the, when the minister uh, announced the opening of the market. Is a couple of months, as i.e. two months, uh, are we likely to see a manufacturing leaf over there in that time? That's a very valid point, uh, because back in February when uh, I was in attendance at those events in uh, Boston, New York and Philadelphia, uh, we put that question to the minister about uh, approval for manufacturing beef. And at that time, he expected there was a few weeks or a couple of months away. Uh, the fact that they said a couple of months again... Uh, what several months later it uh, does suggest that the can has been kicked down the road a bit here but I do sense that he and his department of officials do appreciate the urgency uh, and the need and this is the real attractive piece of the market that our companies and our farmers uh, will get real benefit from if we can get access to so I've no doubt they've made it a serious priority whether or not the minister's been over optimistic or not when he says uh, a couple of months I think for the sake of the Irish beef industry uh, we would be all hoping that he is correct and I suppose we'll be holding to him to account on that basis. And finally, the, the same but different uh, the situation, current situation with China. Uh, any movement there? China is very much in the news these days, as we know, for its uh, wider economic problems. Uh, we, however, would have to take a long-term view and say that that has to be a priority market for us as well. Uh, it was very interesting to note the last week that uh, both the Irish Farmers Association and Meat Industry Ireland, the trade association for the meat factories, uh, would have issued uh, a virtually uh, the same statement or the same press release uh, calling on the minister to ramp up his efforts in terms of opening markets, uh, export markets, to a 
accommodate the extra production that's coming into the system with the expansion in the dairy herd this year. Uh, there's that extra uh, 150,000, 200,000 cattle that will be coming on stream in 2017. All parties recognise that uh, international markets are the places that we have to get that beef out into. And it's in that context that China is a huge priority for us. It's a different market again. It's very much a market for the lower value cuts of beef. It's a market for bone-in cuts of beef. Uh, there will be challenges developing that, but it certainly is the place that we need to be. And we have to look at it in the context of a long-term market and probably disregard the, the activities and the news that China has been in over the past 10 days or so for stock market problems. Uh, those will come and go. It will remain a huge market even when, when uh, the wider economic news comes off the front page. So still positive, but not today or tomorrow? Absolutely. And from what I understand, again, I know there were some very positive announcements at the start of the year about China lifting its export ban on Ireland. That's true. But that really has just started the start of a process rather than the completion of a process. We now are into the situation where visits go back and forward, uh, protocols are exchanged and, and certificates draft and various draft forms are exchanged. And the uh, veterinary officials of China and the health authorities of China have to satisfy themselves on Irish procedures and controls. We would look at that and say, well, surely that is uh, exchanging a few emails, one or two meetings, and that should be the job done. That's not how the Chinese work. Everything that's done with China is done on the basis of building a relationship, building confidence in each other, and it's a slow, painstaking process. But uh, again, I think the prize is very worth, well worth having, worth waiting for, and I've no doubt that the Minister and his officials are pushing this as hard as they can. I suppose we all urge them to work even harder at it and try and get it faster, but the Chinese will work at a in a time frame that suits them, uh, not any Irish agenda, whether it's a commercial market agenda or an Irish political agenda. Those things won't mean anything to them. Phil, I'm very informative. Thank you very much. We hope that you're enjoying this Irish Farmers Journal podcast, brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy. Find out more at farmersjournal.ie. Hi, my name is Kira Leahy, and I'm consumer editor in Irish Country Living, and I'm here with Ashing Hussey, who's one of our journalists. Now, some weeks in Country Living, we're talking about farming in Mayo, and other weeks we're talking about farming in Mead, but this week we're talking about farming in Malawi, which is pretty different. Um, Ashing, how did you end up in Malawi, and um, what were you uh, writing about while you were over there? So I've been to Africa now a few times uh, for a country living. Uh, this time I travelled out there with a fund um, that helps journalists from Ireland travel over to developing countries and report on issues over there. Mm -hmm. And it's called the Simon Cumbers Media Fund. So I just decided to go over to Malawi. Um, I thought it was an interesting country. They're struggling a lot with um, issues like climate change and and gender as well. So um, just, just decided to go over there, Kira. <laughs> and um, what's farming like in Malawi? It's mainly rain fed agriculture, so maize is their main crop okay. um, and it's their staple, so they'd, they'd eat it you know, on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. um, kind of like potatoes here. Kind of like, yeah, okay. exactly. So, um, yeah, it's mainly rain fed, so obviously climate change is having a big impact over there. It's mainly crops, not many people would own cows. If you own one cow, you're probably the wealthiest person in the village over there, okay. or, a, or a goat, you're, you know you're high up there um, and they wouldn't be using animals really for, for milk or for meat. It's kind of like, you know, slaughtering for like a party or something okay, like that. Right. Yeah. And what about technology? Uh, technology over there is like not many, they wouldn't have phones and laptops as such, you know, they're kind of more for the wealthy people and, and if there's a phone, it could be shared in the community. Um, but there's a charity over there called Farm Radio that is, you know, using IT to improve the lives of farmers over there. Um, because, you know, radio is probably the most powerful medium mm -hmm. that is, can be used because a lot of farmers there are actually, you know, they can't read. So it's, um, it's probably... So the farmers journal wouldn't do much good over there. No, the farmers journal <laughs> wouldn't do much good over there, but I suppose the, the radio station is their farmers journal as such. <laughs> And what kind of information are they getting from the radio? So the farm radio trains journalists to to uh, convey certain messages on agriculture. So um, the the radio station I visited had a twice weekly program on you know different things that farmers wanted to know about. So the journalists actually go out into the community and say, "What do you want to know?" So the farmers would say, oh, "I want to learn how to compost. I want to learn how to plant my crops properly." Um, 
so radio shows are actually based on that and what the okay. farmers actually want to learn, which is really useful. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting in your article that, you know, farm advisors aren't, you know, they wouldn't get farm advisors going out much or anything like that. Not at all. So they could be walking miles and miles to go out to visit a farm advisor. In fact, there's uh, only one farm advisor to 2,500 farmers. Wow. So you mightn't see a farm advisor for, for years. Um, so obviously this farm radio cuts out a lot of time for farmers, you know, they don't have to walk for miles to meet an extension worker, um, the, the, the knowledge is there and it's really accessible. Well, I'm sure it makes uh, many of our listeners appreciate their Chagas advisor a bit more when they hear that. I think it will. Um, Ashley, what about the future? What does the future hold um, for farming in Malawi? Um, well, they're, they're going to struggle a lot now with climate change and um, and the, the extreme weather conditions that come with that. So the maize crop is actually down significantly this year. So there could be food shortages now in the coming months. Um, so farmers are going to have to diversify. They'll have to look at like planting different you know, crops, like um, like potatoes now do, would do quite well out there. And then charities like Concern are helping out like with livestock, like, you know, giving farmers goats and showing them how to, you know, how to farm poultry and things like that. So just kind of, it's diversification. I think farmers out there kind of have to embrace change in order to, to progress. And that's probably quite difficult when education levels are low. But hopefully now with, you know, the help of, of NGOs out there that uh, things will improve in Malawi. And finally, Ashley, you were just saying that maize isn't doing very well. Like what's the... Um you know, what's the attitude over there? Is there a nervousness about this? You know, how how are, is there any tension over there? What's the feeling over there? They're quite nervous, all right? I suppose there's, there's awful worry, like when maize is their staple crop and, you know, they're not selling it, they're using it at home. Um, so conservation agriculture kind of has been presented as a, an alternative and that's when um, it's kind of like mulching. And... Um, but farmers still over there are kind of slow to embrace it because, like any kind of farmer, they want to see results first. So mm -hmm. if they see their neighbour doing it and it does well, they'll go for it. Yeah, absolutely. But um, it'll take a few years, I think, before there's change. But um, maybe maybe now with the crop going down, so the harvest down so much, this kind of might be the push to change things. Okay, very interesting. Thanks very much, Ashling, for your time. And uh, there's more on that in this week's Irish Country Living. The Irish Farmers Journal podcast online at farmersjournal.ie, on the Irish Farmers Journal app and on iTunes every Thursday. Brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy.